This is Twit. So many have said that Tesla is essentially setting the gold standard for how cars can handle over-the-air updates. And Tesla isn't bound by any laws to prevent them from rolling out any new features to customers without having dealership or mandatory middleman steps. Tesla code, codes a new feature. It pushes it out to the cars without any middleman. So why is this a problem for automakers even in 2017? Well, this particular R's article points out that it could be due to contractual reasons between OEMs and their dealer networks. It's not a technical issue, as Tesla's proven. But the article believes that OEMs can't offer existing customers new features for their vehicles without the car dealerships getting their cut. Let me take it at a different angle from this topic. So remember back in 2015 when GM tried to push the Digital Millennium Copyright Act on consumers? Well, it's, that act has been around since 20, 2000, and it started as an anti-internet privacy like legislation. But automakers wanted to use it to try to make um, and make you prevent you from working on your car and make it illegal. Yes, kind of illegal. So since today's vehicles use such large amounts of tech and software, GM wanted to list them as a mobile computing device. So hypothetically, then the law would protect automakers from pesky owners looking to alter any sort of technology in the in the car. What does this prove? Well, it adds to the fire that cars are already a low profit animal and car companies have to give dealers a way to add to the profit other than just extended warranties and nice floor mats. So if nothing goes wrong with the car and standard maintenance is the only means for profit, dealers kind of suffer if the service center doesn't rake it in. So I guess the question here, Cheaper, what, what's the author trying to get at? Is it a contractual thing? Like what's going on in the auto industry that they just can't provide technolo technology updates to the vehicles uh, like Tesla's proven? What's going on? Well, yeah, I think a lot of it is, remember, the auto industry is 100 years old. There's a lot of baggage that they're dragging along, and they've had to make lots and lots and lots of promises to their dealerships. Because if we go back into the time of our grandparents, they were very few car dealerships. It was, it was tough to buy a car because there just weren't that many dealerships. So the car manufacturers had to make lots of promises to help guarantee, you know, from things like financing to literally kickbacks, you know, Ford Motor Corporation or GM or whoever's, the financing actually has what they call a stipend for um, salespeople that get customers to finance their cars. You know, when I, when I bought my Volkswagen, uh, we negotiated, went crazy, and then I wrote a check for the car. You know, because I had a home equity loan, I'd rather be able to claim my interest. You should have seen the salesperson's face. It looked like the kid was going to cry because apparently I took a lot of money off the table for him. These are the kinds of promises that the car manufacturers have made to the dealerships in order to get them to open dealerships in places where the consumers want them. <clears throat> well, the problem is... They're taking it far enough that over the air, even though some of the uh, cars are capable, like the Ford Motor Corporation um, entertainment systems in my wife's vehicle, some of the features can be updated over the air. But we still got hit by recalls for just some reprogramming which means we had to go in and the dealership was hoping and praying that we're going to go and coordinate it with, say, an oil change or checkup or something like that so that they can go and make their profits. Um, so the unfortunate thing is the current automakers have this baggage. Tesla doesn't. But it is my opinion that a lot of the large automakers are seeing the writing on the wall and consumers are demanding over-the-air updates. In fact, my, one of my major decision points on my next vehicle is going to be over the air. And right now, that's Tesla. So right. we'll see. My um, The first Teslas were supposed to ship today, uh, be handed over today. And supposedly early next week, I find out where in line I am for my Tesla Model 3 reservation. Right. So it's interesting because GM just recently hired a chief data officer. And they've always kind of collected data via their OnStar network. I mean, that network has been been around for a while. And it does also have kind of over-the-air capabilities, especially for the car. It can pull telemetry data from your car, whether the car's locked, it's not locked, how your engine's doing, that kind of thing. 
So it's not like, like you were saying, I mean, it, it's not like it's a technology restriction, even though there's a lot, the car industry is pretty old and it does have a lot of baggage. You would think that the technology is there and they, that kind of proves that it is. So, uh, you know, not, it's not that they just can't do it. I'm sure they could probably do it. I'm sure it's just a flip of a switch. It just seems like there is something holding them back, and most likely it is the the profit animal that they call, you know, that happens when it comes to dealerships. I think they just need a way to provide, hey, go to the dealership, pay two hundred fifty bucks to get your system updated or to get your computer chip in your in your car updated, you know, and so they kind of get um, a way to kind of pay it back um, to get more profit out of it. Do you oh, think yeah. that? Well, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say, you know, Harman Kardon, one of the largest manufacturers of automotive systems, has had OTA capabilities in their systems, oh, geez, at least for the last five or six years. It's just that then the OEMs, the big OEMs, aren't taking them up on it. Right. So, Emily, yes, I'm not Mr. Moneybags. Uh, I've got a 10-year-old Volkswagen Golf that... You know, it needs to be replaced someday in in the relatively near future. I think my a Tesla is going to be great because it's probably going to be the last car I'm ever going to buy. And uh, OTA just happens to be one of the features that I'm going to demand when I, you know, start looking at cars. I think an interesting take on this, and maybe a question back to you, Cheever, is, you know, I, I kind of feel like, you know, with the with the onset of with the kind of the innovations of autonomous vehicles, it's almost like the OTA has to become a standard because if, if it doesn't, how are they how are these particular vehicles going to be updated? I mean, how are they going to continue to improve the AI uh, on these vehicles to handle different sensor arrays and and different types of uh, environments and, you know, that kind of thing? So I kind of throw it back to you, Cheaper. Do you do you think that you know by not having this technology across the board, that these car vehicle these companies are kind of hindering innovation on the vehicles? Actually, I'm not sure. I'm really say would say hindering innovation. I would definitely say though that the um, car dealerships need to get on board. They need to eat this learning curve. The designers need to eat the learning curve. They need to get the experience that Tesla has been getting for the last, you know, half a dozen years or so. And the reality is, is yes, I for, I I totally agree with you. Uh, self-driving, you know, the various flavors of self-driving, you know, even if it's just a fancy dancy um, cruise control that has lane keeping or auto braking and things like that, this is all software. You, we're both programmers, or at least you know, I used to be a programmer. Lou is definitely a programmer, and humans make mistakes, and we find bugs all the time, and we need to be able to fix them. Does that mean we have to wait, you know, three months, six months, or whatever, until the next vehicle checkup for the dealership to go and stick a USB key in to the car computer to do an update? No, I, that's just not going to buy it, especially when safety is on the, on the, on the table. Right. Over the air has absolutely positively got to happen and the dealerships and the designers have to get on board. They need to get that experience, and they're not getting it at the moment. Yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting topic. I mean, you basically pointed out. I mean, I've seen you know many examples in the wild of software companies supplying an update. Um, you know, whether it's you know a big download or whatnot, and then it causes kind of an epidemic of you know onset of other issues. And in order for them to correct that, they need a quick way to almost patch that issue. And, you know, in this case right now, what happens is if you go get an update on your vehicle and then you leave, essentially you start seeing symptoms. You have to take it back right to the vehicle, to the company. Um, and it, it causes issues. And if you try to do your own update, it, it does a whole bunch of other problems. So I think there's, there's causes lots of problems there as well. Um, another thing to, too, that kind of think about and I get your thoughts on this as well, Cheever, is, you know, a lot of the car companies are saying that it's obviously due to security as well. We've seen many examples in the past, especially like, for instance, the, the researchers who took over the Jeep and kind of drove it into, to, uh, to a ditch there. I think the car companies are kind of afraid of the ability to do over the air, um, in case somebody can, can do different types of attacks on the vehicle in order to not only take over the data transmission, but also, um, you know, do kind of denial of service attacks and so on. Do you think that this is something that's also kind of preventing or we're again, just going right back to the fact that it's the, it's the profit machine. 
Yeah, um, again, profit. You know, this is the having the Jeep was actually attacked to the entertainment system, and also because Jeep they're using a, a open APN for God's sakes. You know, this is this is old technology. Just ask someone in the chat room like HiWeb that understands this kind of thing. Private APNs are not hard. Um, you know, I got AT and T to set one up for my research project. And that instantly blocked everybody in the world off from my research project except the modems in my research project. Not hard to do. There's a lot of things that people can do already for IoT, and the automakers are not eating the learning curve. They need to eat the learning curve. They need to get data specialists in. They need to get security specialists in. You know, maybe JJ to the 4884 can go and um, work for people like GM or some or his favorite car company and help them secure it. This is not rocket science anymore. IoT needs to grow up, and the IoT on four wheels needs to grow up faster. Right. Yeah. In fact, you know, one of my is back in college. I mean, years ago, I, I did it actually a senior design project for Dana Corp, which is actually part of the Ford motor industry. And we built, um, you know, a single board computer that pulled sensor data from the universal joints on four wheel drive vehicles to, to, you know, get noise and the angle that the joint was going on. Um, and that was able to transmit it back over the vehicle's communication. And I, so even back then, years ago, 14, 15 years ago, it was capable of doing it. So I'm, I'm sure that hopefully the industry will at some point just push them forward, just push them forward.